when I say Jesus is Lord, you know what it means? It means my sickness is not my Lord. Failures are not my Lord. Poverty is not my Lord. Fear is not my Lord. Problems are not my Lord. Challenges and difficulties are not my Lord. Jesus is my Lord. I me now under your wings. There is a spirit world, there is a natural world. In the spirit world, there are demonic powers working, wreaking havoc and doing all kinds of things. But we as a spiritual person living in this natural world, we can dominate over Satan and his demon in the natural world by the power of God's word. I'll show you how. Now, the angels of God are given as our helpers. We are spiritual beings. The angels of God are given as our helpers. Uh, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 5. Let me read verse 5 first and then I'm going to read verse 13 and 14. For to which of the angels, notice it's talking about angels, which of, to which of the angels did he ever say, that is did God ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And again I'll be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. Now he's trying to talk about the superiority of Jesus. This man, Jesus, that who has come as a man, God's son who has come as a man. He says, did, any, did God say to any of his angels, you are my son, today I have begotten you, or I'll be to him a father and he shall be to me a son? Never said to any angels, he says. Look at verse 13. But to which of the angels has he ever said? Again, the same kind of expression. To which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits 
sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation. Very loaded passage here. Did he ever say to any of the angels, sit at my right hand until I make all your enemies your footstool? No. Why? Because he's describing now who the angels are, what is their status. Many times people think that angels are bigger than us, greater than us. That is why in the Old Testament you see sometimes angels come and appear and some fellows fall on their feet, you know. I think the falling on the feet thing has been there from the beginning, I think. <laughs> Ever since man has fallen, he's looking for somebody to fall at their feet, you know. When the angel comes and appears, he immediately falls at the feet. And the, you always see the angel say, get up, get up, get up, why are you falling at my feet? You shouldn't be falling at my feet. You are bigger, <laughs> literally, without saying that, the angels are saying, you're bigger than me, man. Why are you falling at my feet? What are the angels? He's describing the angels. He says, because the Jewish people had a big idea about angels. Angels, oh, they're great. We're nothing like that kind of idea. He says, to which of the angels did God ever say, sit at my right hand until I make all your enemies your footstool? To God's son who has come in flesh in human form, this man, Jesus Christ, God said, sit at my right hand until I make all your enemies your footstool. To man, God has given that honor. That's the whole point here. Not to an angel. Man is more honored than the angel. Man is much greater than the angel is the point here. And so he describes the angels and describing them, he says, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit Salvation, He's asking the question, don't you know that angels are nothing but ministering spirits? Simple words, servants. Messengers. Are they not just ministering spirits? Ministering spirits to who? To minister for those who inherit salvation. Who are the inheritors of salvation? Don't look at the next person sitting here. Anytime we say something, some people are like, maybe he's talked about him or talked about that guy over there. No. Who are the inheritors of salvation? I tell you, my friend, you and I are the heirs of salvation. God's heirs. We're the heirs of salvation. And the angels of God are nothing but ministering spirits to minister, to serve. To be at the beck and call of the heirs of salvation. Yeah. Another verse. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 6.3. 6, Do you not know that we shall judge angels? I'll stop right there. That's enough. Do you not know? Paul is asking the believers. Do you not know that we shall judge angels? I'm reading all these verses to just show you that we are bigger than angels. See, the devil has convinced them that angels are bigger. Now we have to convince people. No, no, you are bigger. <laughs> the Bible clearly says, do you not know that we shall judge angels? See, the problem with the Corinthians is they didn't realize how big they are. <laughs> says, why are you behaving like this? You are people that are going to sit as judges over angels of God. They're going to stand in attention with their hands folded before you and answer you as you judge them do you not know that you will judge angels? Take your position and your place. Be the man that God has called you to be, he says, to the believers. You are supposed to be judging angels one day. That's the way God looks at you, he says. Another verse. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 18. Verse 10. Take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones. The little ones are referring to small children. We read from first verse, it's all talking about children, you know. Verse 3 says, unless you are converted and become as little children, you'll by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Verse 4 says, whoever humbles himself as his little child is greater in the kingdom of heaven. Verse 5, whosoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. Verse 6, whosoever causes one of these little ones to believe in me to sin, who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to, if a, a millstone were hung around his neck, and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. So he's talking, I just read to you, to show you that he's talking about little children. And now, it's continuing, and in verse 10 he says, take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones. Talking about little children, my friend. 
do not despise one of these little ones for i say to you that in heaven very important statement their angels always see the face of my father who is in heaven amazing truth <laughs> amazing statement about little children he says do not despise these little children because their angels hello their angels the little ones have their angels it seems their angels behold the face of my father in heaven i read from new king james if you read king james it will say behold the face that means they are looking at the face of the father in heaven the angels of god so that they can do what god tells them to do for their little children for these little children if god wants anything done for these little children the angels are waiting to go and do it to protect them to save them to guard them to whatever angels are beholding the face of god what way, what way would you take it i think that's the way you have to take it they're waiting for god's orders on behalf of these little ones to do things for them the ones that can't do much for themselves they're weak they can't help themselves god has got angels who will help them and they behold the face of my father in heaven their angels behold the face of my father in heaven it says amazing angels are servants of heirs of salvation people that are in christ angels are beholding the face of the father in heaven we are bigger than angels therefore we'll judge angels one day now let's go to the verse that i wanted to bring you to that is luke chapter 12 verse 8 and 9 also i say to you whoever conf- whoever confesses me before men him the son of man also will confess before the angels of god <laughs> have you ever read this statement have you ever understood what it's talking about he says whoever confesses me before men him the son of man will also confess uh, also will confess before the angels of god that's very interesting he says if he said whoever confesses me before men i will confess in heaven that would have been enough he says i will confess before the angels of god he says i will confess before the angels of god he could have said i will confess before god but he says i will confess before the angels of god why look at the next verse but he who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of god what is the meaning of this whole thing it means that when you confess christ see when you confess christ what are you confessing him as you're confessing him as your savior at the time of salvation right as your lord and some people say this is only referring to that salvation thing that if you confess jesus as your savior and lord then he will confess you before the angels of god but that doesn't make sense you know there must be something more than it there are some people that say some some bible teachers that say that it not only refers to the salvation thing of confession of christ as your lord and savior it also refers to the confession of who you are in christ what god is to you through christ and what uh, redemption means for you and and uh, what belongs to you in and through christ it belong the confession here is an all round confession of the believer who is in christ not just a salvation confession that jesus is your lord but the confession that jesus is your everything right last week i told you when you confess jesus as your lord after your salvation you are not doing the same thing that you did at the time of salvation where you came into christ through confessing jesus as lord you are doing something more when when i say jesus is my lord today it's not the same as what i said when i got saved the day i got saved when i the day i got saved i seated him in the in my heart in the throne of my heart as my lord and savior on that day that is the confession but today when i say jesus is lord do you know what it means it means my sickness is not my lord failures are not my lord poverty is not my lord fear is not my lord problems are not my lord challenges and difficulties are not my lord jesus is my lord 
because jesus is my lord other things cannot rule over me fear is not my lord worry is not my lord jesus is my lord that's what it means today for me when i say jesus is lord right and that's what it means today, today for you so so some of them say yes it refers to this comprehensive confession of who jesus is and what you are because of jesus and the redemption of the cross of calvary it's a total confession so when you confess before men when you confess in this world who jesus is to you you know when you confess in fact it's talking about difficult circumstances before that you know people that come to kill you people come that come to destroy you and people that come against you and all of that and so in verse 7 he says very hair, hairs of your head are all numbered do not fear therefore you are you are of more value than many sparrows and then he says and i say to you whosoever confesses me before men him the son of man will confess before the angels of god so when you confess and hold on to your confession regardless of your problems and difficulties and the challenges that you face you stand on that confession and continue to confess and never give up the confession of who you are in Christ and what Christ means to you when you hold on to that confession in spite of all that you face today the one at the right hand of god god god's son jesus christ will also confess you not just before god but before the angels of god why because when he confesses you what does he confess he confesses what you are confessing because what is confession is saying the same as see confession is defined as this saying the same as same as what same as what others are saying suppose you are accused you go to a court and you are accused of say murder or something like that and they say this man wants to make a confession they say do you want to make a confession and you get on the stand and you say yeah i want to make a confession so you make a confession what do you confess they are saying that you murdered the your confession is yes i murdered yes i did it that's what confession is they are saying something your confession is saying the same as what they say that's what confession is so when jesus confesses you before the father and before the angels of god what will he confess he is not confessing something else he is confessing what you confessed here when we talked about the advocate eh? we talked about how it's important that you confess the right thing because he can confess the advocate can only appeal for you in the court only according to what you confess if you told him i'm the one that did it then he will talk accordingly yeah he's the one that did it reduce the sentence do something have mercy on him or something like that if you say i never did it somebody else did it it's all wrong allegation against me then he will stand with you and he will say he never did it we can prove it we have the evidence. see it's all what you say only he can say right bible says if you sin we have an advocate with the father right so what are you saying when you when you sin you go and say yeah i have sinned and that advocate says yes forgive him on the basis of the shed blood you see this is how it works so confession works like this that when you confess jesus here on earth jesus confesses you before the angels of god what does he confess he confesses whatever you are confessing and when he confesses that when he says that he is a child that when when he is confessing he is confessing what you confess suppose you said i am a child of god i am more than a conqueror god never leaves me nor forsakes me he says yes that is absolutely true he is god's son he is a child of god he is the heir of all the blessings he shall never be forsaken the angels of god begin to get to work immediately that is why before the angels of god he confesses now for those of you who don't want to think about angels coming to our help let me ask you to turn with me to genesis chapter 24 2440 you remember abraham sends his servant out to get a wife for his son his son was born at the age of 100 he was 100 years old his wife was 90 
So you better be very careful choosing a wife for him. Because you waited so long to get this son, you don't want to ruin it by getting him the wrong one, you know. <laughs> so this is serious business for Abraham. He sends his servant, most trusted servant, Eliezer. He says, go to the place where I come from and choose a wife for my son. But the servant, he has his own apprehensions. He says, what if the girl doesn't come with me? If I go and I tell everything and, and I make a deal and the girl doesn't want to go and the girl has not seen the boy, why should she go? If she does not want to come, what shall I do? And the answer, listen, Abraham's answer to Eliezer, he said, but he said to me, now Eliezer is speaking about how Abraham sent him. He said, he said to me, the Lord before whom I walk will send his angel with you and prosper your way. And you shall take a wife for my son from my family and from my father's house. How confident Abraham is. He thinks that God is going to send an angel, depute an angel, for this business of finding a girl for his son. And some people think that's unbelievable, brother. You mean to tell me that he's in the marriage bureau business? He's in every business. <laughs> he's got his own marriage bureau. <laughs> he says, yes. My God, the God whom I worship, the God whom I follow, will send his angel with you. How confident he is. He already knows back in Genesis, you know, back in those days, he knew that God sends his angel. Sends his angel. I think when the heaven heard it coming out of his mouth, all the angels were standing there and immediately they were called and said, hear that. Did you hear that? <laughs> Go get the job done. So when Abraham said the angel of God, God will send his angels and you'll prosper your way. The word prosperity is a general word, you see. Prosperity is everything working together for your good. That's what prosperity is. It'll prosper your way. That means you'll succeed in whatever you're trying to do. In this case, finding a girl. And you shall take a wife for my son from my family and my, from, from my father's house. He said, you'll come back with a wife. Don't worry. Because the angel, God's going to send there. He knows. You know how he knows? Because God told him to go send, offer his son Isaac as a sacrifice. And Abraham went. And before Abraham went there, God had already sent a ram there. And the ram was caught in a thicket waiting for him there. And he named that place. God stopped him from killing his son. He said, no, no, I can't. told you to come here not to kill your son, but to tell you how I'm going to kill my son on the cross of Calvary for entire humanity. I want to teach you a lesson on that. So take this ram and kill that ram as a sacrifice, as a symbol of what I'm going to do, that I have prepared a ram and I've kept ready the son of God to be offered as a sacrifice. And Abraham killed that ram on that altar and named that place Jehovah Jireh, which means God gets ready. We have a God who gets ready to meet our needs even before our need arises. So Abraham knew that before you need it, God is ready. He is not scratching his head trying to find where he can find whatever you are asking for after you asked him for it. You know, he's already got it ready. Before you ask him, he's ready with it because he already knows what that you will need it on that day. So Abraham now says, God knows my my son needs a wife. And he will send an angel. He's probably already orchestrated it. And lo, behold, lo and behold, Eliezer goes. And on the way, he thinks, when I go, I must find a girl who would behave in this way, who should offer water for myself and my servants and my camels and all of that. And the girl comes. God sets it up so wonderfully. God is a good orchestrator of these things. He's the greatest matchmaker. He goes and pulls into town. And the girl is already ready waiting for him at the well with the water, <laughs> gives water to him and for his camels, for his servants and everything, so hospitable, so exactly what he thought in his mind, that she must be a hospitable, good girl, you know. And he went quiet about her and went to her home and made the deal, and talked, to her, talked to them and everything. Finally, you know what they said? This is the Lord's doing, they said. Just like Abraham said, God has sent his angel, set up the whole thing. You don't believe it? He sets up the whole thing and gets everything orchestrated and finishes the whole deal. Amen. This 
This is the season of Jubilee. This is the season of Jubilee. Singing and dancing for you and me. Singing and dancing for you and me. Thanking and praising because we're free. Thanking and praising because we're free. Oh, this is the year of Jubilee. Oh, this is the year of Jubilee. Put your hands together. Everybody praise the Lord. Put your hands together. Sing, shout, and praise the Lord. This is the season of Jubilee. This is the season of Jubilee. Singing and dancing for you and me. Singing and dancing for you and me. And thanking and praising because we're free. Thanking and praising because we're free. Oh, this is the year of Jubilee. Oh, this is the year. Don't you believe? Put your hands together. Everybody praise the Lord. Put your hands together. Sing and shout and praise the Lord. Everything that was stolen shall be returned unto me. Mother, father, sister, brother, they will all go free. Everything that was stolen shall be returned unto me. Sing, dancing, praising, shouting, increase in victory. Sing that again. Everything that was sown shall be returned unto me. Mother, father, sister, brother, they will all go free. Everything that was sown shall be returned unto me. Sing, dancing, praising, shouting, increase in victory. shall be returned unto me mother father sister brother they will all go free everything that was stolen shall be returned unto me sing dancing praise and shouting increase and victory